Welcome to the CEC report. It's August 31st. I'm Robert Barwick and I'm joined again by CEC leader Craig Isherwood. Welcome Craig. Yeah, thanks Robbie. In this week's CEC report, the Queen sacked Whitlam, but does it matter? Secondly, the Whitlam sacking legacy, global miners rip hundreds of billions from Australia. And finally, media whores at their worst in Syria. So first, the Queen sacked Whitlam, but does it matter? There's a new book that's about to be released, Craig, by an author named Jenny Hocking, and it's a biography of Gough Whitlam called Gough Whitlam, His Time. And this book draws on a lot of archive evidence that has only been made public in recent years. Um, so there's a lot of new revelations in this book that haven't uh, been known before. And in doing writing this book on Gough Whitlam, uh, Jenny Hocking inadvertently blows up the official cover story about the 1975 Whitlam dismissal. A cover story, Robbie, that we've always said that the Queen was responsible for the sacking of Whitlam, and people have had a lot of uh, disdain about that. Oh, the Queen could never do such. She's above such things. Well, this has actually blown the whistle. Well, the, she's above such things. They would say as a, as a person she wouldn't do that kind of thing. They would say under law she's not, she doesn't have that kind of power. She's a mere figurehead. All these myths have been blown up. But, but like I said, inadvertently, Hocking, <laughs> that wasn't Hocking's intention because no. it's like it reminded me of, a, of watching a, a news report where there's a live cross to a journalist at a, at a scene of an accident and the journalist is reporting it to the cameras and in the background a murder is taking place but people are only focusing on the accident rather than the live action in the background because mm -hmm. in this case, Hocking is focusing on this mysterious third man being a High Court Judge Sir Anthony Mason as the rumoured third man who existed between, who functioned between um, Sir John Kerr, the Governor General, and Sir Garfield Barwick, the Chief Justice of the High Court. So that's her focus. However, in, in, in telling this story, she quotes archive material that show, shows the Queen ran a carefully planned conspiracy m that was started months in advance to rid Australia of the Whitlam government, the democratically elected Whitlam government. So let me give the details in essence. We've put out a release on this. Um, but to set the stage, it's important to know that even Gough Whitlam Craig does not believe the Queen sacked him. No. And the reason for that is he called the palace, obviously in shock, and said, did you sack me? Did the Queen sack me? And her personal private secretary, in, this is Whitlam reports this in his, in his book, her personal private secretary, Sir Martin Charteris said to Whitlam, no, the Queen knew nothing about what was going on. That's what Whitlam was told. Well, listen to these details. Um, the first important point is Sir John Kerr, who's a former MI6 agent, by the way, when he took the job of Governor General, he took it with the intention of using his reserve powers. And that fact has been confirmed mm. by Sir Anthony Mason himself when he wrote his comeback to what Jenny Hocking has said. Mason reported that he said to, to Kerr, you'll just be rubber stamping, your job will be just to rubber stamp legislation. And Kerr said, no it won't, I have real p reserve powers and, I'll, and basically I'll use them. Um, from March 1975, which is, which is important to note that that is nine months before the dismissal and eight months before there was any constitutional crisis to make it an issue, Goff, um, Sir John Kerr uh, set up a brains trust with the help of the Australian National University of Legal Minds and this brains trust was to advise him on what his powers were as a Governor General. So this was, he set this up with a clear intention, obviously. Um, what, in this process, one of the concerns that was raised was that if the Prime Minister, Gough Whitlam, got wind that he, Kerr, intended to sack him, the Prime Minister might go to the Queen and ask the Queen to sack the Governor-General first, before that could happen. Because under the Constitution, the um, Queen acts on the advice of the Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. and this, and Kerr spoke about this with Mason, and he spoke about this with Menzies' former secretary, Geoffrey Yeehan. Uh, I think it's really important, Robbie, that people realise that this is completely and utterly out of order. The, oh. uh, I mean, the Governor-General is supposed to take his advice from the Attorney-General and from the Prime Minister. 
Right, that is the convention, so called. Not even judges from the High Court. Not allowed who to he cut. was seeking So what he had to do, he set up a secretive, it was actually covert, they were allowed to talk about it, sell within ANU in order to discuss the, these reserve powers that Kerr knew that he had. So, I mean, this was not accidental. There was an intention in Kerr's mind in actually to use this. And what you're powers. highlighting is, when you say out of order, the other, way, the other word for that is illegal. Yes. What he's doing is illegal, right? So we'll come back to that when, when we get pose the question, does it matter? Um, the key Here's the key bit. In September 1975, a month before the, the, the so-called blocking of supply, for those who know your history, we can't go to all the details of that, but it was the blocking of supply by the Liberal country opposition that precipitated a constitutional crisis. That began in October. And the blocking of supply is the, the money the government needs to function to fund the... If the supply bills aren't passing Parliament, there's no one can get paid. Yeah. So that began in October. So this is before that. Kerr was in Papua New Guinea on a state visit um, to do with their independence with Prince Charles. And he spoke to Prince Charles personally, directly, about his concern that Whitlam might seek Kerr's sacking before Kerr could sack Whitlam. And Prince Charles's response to that, according to Kerr's notes in his archives, was he didn't think the Queen should have to listen to Whitlam's advice in those circumstances. So in other words, Charles is saying, what's the constitution matter, right? However, Charles, wasn't, Charles was young, and people, people are, are, who are reporting this say, oh, he was naive and uninformed. Well, that's a bit of a cover story. Huh. He reported back to the palace, right? And he spoke to Mumsy about this. So the Queen's personal private secretary, Sir Martin Charteris, the man whom Gough would later speak to about this, wrote to Kerr saying, Yes, the Queen would have to listen to Whitlam's advice and, and act on that, but she would seek to delay as long as possible. In other words, she would use her wiles to make sure that the sacking went ahead anyway. That is the key here. Um, and to the cream on the cake is on the day, you'd had a week, um, sorry, a month or so of supply being blocked. Um, Whitlam had initially didn't want to, initially had not wanted to go to an election, but on November 11, 1975, he had decided, no, we will go to an election. That resolved the issue. Well, that, that was a half cent election, Robbie. A half cent yeah. election resolved the issue. By calling that, then there was no crisis anymore and this could be resolved. Take it to the people. He went to the Governor-General with that intention. The Governor-General knew that's what he wanted to do, but the intention to sack him was overwhelming. And so instead of listening to Whitlam on that, Kerr got in first and handed him the letter, the letter of dismissal. So in other words, the, 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 the Crown apparatus in Australia made sure that the democratic process in Australia did not come into play. They used their powers to get rid of a democratically elected government. And unfortunately, since the election following that cray was a landslide to the Liberals, thanks to Rupert Murdoch running the most vicious slander campaign against the Whitlam government, um, most Australians uh, got a bit brainwashed to think, oh, the Queen probably did a good thing. We put out a release a few days ago, Craig, like I said. In response to our release on this, we've got some replies from people saying, who cares? So my question to you is, who does cares? all this matter? Well, Robert, here you have a classic example of the head of state the Queen in this case, a foreign power actually interfering in the domestic politics of a, of a sovereign country. This is a complete violation of national sovereignty. And what we have been saying all along, it was intentional, we'll get, I think in the next segment we'll talk about what, why this, was, this came about, because it's not what's seen on the surface is actually the important stuff, it's what's going on underneath, what's, what, what's the intention behind this. But look, go back into the period of uh, the 1930s, right? It was the governor... Um, so Philip, Philip Game that sacked the elected representative uh, Jack Lang at that point. Why? Because Jack Lang was going to use the sovereign power that he had to stop the payment of uh, the bond to the bondholders of England in order to, to act for the Australian people. So New South Wales people didn't starve. Uh, Whitlam had put forward a number of policies, including things like buy back the farm, which we'll go to in more detail shortly, and so forth, in order to to uh, to, to further the interests of sovereign Australia. What happens is the Queen steps in and sacks him. And what it also shows is, Robbie, that these governor generals or even governors are not little inane people that just have the, you know, just sit there and 
rubber yeah, stamp they're not things. Rubber stamps they're things. not, and they have enormous reserve powers, and these reserve powers extend all over the place, including into the banking system, where the, 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 the actual uh, powers of the banking system exist in the Governor General, which not many people know about. And it was, it's important, Craig, to note here that we opposed the 1999 Republican referendum, even though we're fierce Republicans, because the Malcolm Turnbull model was just to have a president who w that wouldn't be elected by the people, appointed by Parliament, but keeping the same reserve, undefined reserve powers by which they can effectively, when push comes to shove, function as a dictator. And the, well, that's, that's the interesting thing, is if the people of Australia had the ability to elect their own president, someone who had character and the ability to stand up for the general welfare and for the national sovereignty of Australia, our country wouldn't be in a position that it is today where we have a foreign power, all these hidden reserve powers actually functioning in a way that undermines our national sovereignty. And that's the important thing. People have no idea about this principle of national sovereignty and that's where they're, this is why they say, oh, what does it matter? Is because they actually don't know, they're ignorant. For, um, for those of you, the, among the viewers who can't get over the um, chaos that surrounded the Whitlam government and therefore think it was the worst government in history, I think it's important for us to note that the Whitlam government did do some uh, plenty of things that we would be totally opposed to, such as its 25% across the board tariff cut, etc. But um, what we've specifically identified is that Whitlam incurred the wrath of the Crown because he supported two key ministers, Rex Connor and Jim Cairns, who were real patriots of old Labor, who led the fight to buy back the farm. Mm. And we'll talk about what buying back the farm meant in the next segment when we return. <laughs> Welcome back to the CEC Report. Now, the legacy of the Whitlam sacking. Global miners rip hundreds of billions from Australia. Craig, because the Whitlam government's buy back the farm failed, because of what we just discussed, the, the Crown intervened to make sure it failed. What we've seen since is that the British Crown's Anglo-Dutch raw materials cartel has gorged on Australia's resources. And we'll give you some figures in a second. The key person in this, though, was our favourite, Paul John Keating. John, Paul Keating was the junior minister in the Whitlam government. He was the youngest minister in the Whitlam government because he was the junior minister to Rex Connor. And in fact, you can see in Hansard Keating's speeches up until 1975 when he was working with Connor to buy back the farm. And he, has, he, he de delivered some of the most withering attacks on the foreign control of Australian resources that you'll ever see. But during opposition, Connor had died, you know, Labor was in opposition for eight years in the wilderness. Keating became the Labor Party's minerals and energy spokesman. And you can read any Keating biography, it's right there. He was wined and dined by the mining industry and converted to their view of the world. Um, and I'm going to give you a quote here what their view of the world is. This is from David Love's book, Unfinished Business, Paul Keating's Interrupted Revolution. Those of you who are watching this on YouTube, look up that title on YouTube and, and Paul Keating and you will see Keating launching this book and you can watch those little clips and you can see how much Keating loves this book. So this is an accurate reflection of how Keating thinks, this book. And on page 68, this is the way David Love characterised Keating and Connor. Quote, Connor, a crazy old patriot, will be remembered in history as the man who sent a mysterious Pakistani named Tirith Kemlani into the sooks and bazaars of Arabia in quest for the largest loan he could lay his hands on for the Commonwealth of Australia. The minister had a detailed knowledge of Australia's mineral and energy resources and a bold plan. It was his belief that we should face the rest of the world with our resources piled behind us and stand as a bull terrier guard dog does when it faces the street. We should have no truck with international private enterprise. We should develop our resources with our own public sector loan money under public sector ownership with no share of ownership going to non-Australians. Paul Keating's enthusiastic association with Rex Connor stands as an embarrassment to his later friends and mentors in Treasury, the Reserve Bank and elsewhere, blessed as they were with finely trained minds. So... That's the man Keating did associate with and then he had turned his back completely on that outlook um, so that when he became treasurer, 
he steered Australia's economic policy to one that um, focused on the export of raw materials. And it's under the law of comparative advantage, if you those who know a bit of economics, right? Countries should only focus on what they're best at, right? So Australia should just be a raw materials ex exporter. Um, and what's been the consequence? And, and the specific things was floating the dollar in Keating's mind, and this is, this is explicit from him, was to lower the exchange rate to make exports um, more, our exports easier and cheaper. And ditching tariffs was to do this effectively do the same thing. They're the two big things he did to help the um, mining industry. In the 1990s, minerals overtook um, agricultural exports for the first time. And we've got a graph here that shows the rise of mineral exports in Australia. Um, and in the past decade, here are the two figures I wanted to cite. We just, we just looked up a decade worth of profits from two companies, Craig, the biggest two, Rio Tinto and BHP. Rio Tinto's total profit for the decade of the first uh, decade of the 21st century was $74.365 billion. BHP's profit was $103.638 billion. So, Craig, Australia is now one giant quarry. What can we do to change it? Go back to what Rex Connor was actually proposing in the first place, Robbie, which we've called for, is the nationalisation of our raw materials. If it happened back in 1975 and we had a policy of continuing what, what they were actually looking at doing, of developing the extended industries associated, the value-added industries associated with our raw material sector, then Australia would be an incredibly wealthy place today. But instead, we've been looted blind by these companies, Rio Tinto, in particular, BHP. And I think there was a quote that, uh, uh, that the, um, the Queen would be embarrassed if it became public of just how big her shareholding was in Rio Tinto. So here, we, and we have this uh, saying going around that the Rio Tinto is, a, the, sorry, the Queen is the biggest shareholder in Rio Tinto, which is in fact true. It's been, you know, borne out in various other investigations. So here you have the reason, the actual intention behind the sacking of Whitlam Right? Was it because supply was being blocked? That's all political solutions. But the policy direction that he was pushing was national sovereign policies to exclude the, the looting, the free trade policies of the British Empire, which is, of course, the, 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 the empire that we have today, this monetarist empire of globalisation. And British Crown, British Empire power depends on its control through the City of London of global finance, and global resources. And that's what's happened. And so Australia, you know, we've, we've become a so-called two-speed economy. Actually, we're stalled in both respects because right now the commodity prices are falling, which is, you know, because China is not expanding as fast as it used to be. And secondly, we are just literally losing because of the manipulation of exchange rates, which we say should be fixed exchange rates in terms of currencies. You're losing entire sectors of our manufacturing industry, particularly our high-tech industries. I mean, there's reports that Ford, for example, is not even looking at developing models for 2016. What does that mean? It means that they intend possibly to shut down in Australia. And that goes to the other flip side of that export of raw materials, which is this graph we, d we did for our new citizen that shows in the same period as raw materials exports go up, manufactured imports, imports into Australia also rose because our manufacturing sector collapsed. So this is, this is the issue behind what happened in 1975, and you know, we've had it nearly, nearly 40 years now, of these policies, and what we're seeing today, the collapse of our economy is based upon this particular directionality that was, was, was instigated by the actions of the Queen herself. Yep. All right. I'll just point people, you can look up in our website, we have a carefully drafted policy there for nationalising Australia's raw materials. Just search that and you'll find it. Um, when we come back, we're going to finish off today's report with a subject... Um, discussing the uh, crisis in Syria. Finally, media whores at their worst in Syria. Now, what we're about to go through in this segment, Craig, is extra relevant in the light of the news that's come through overnight that five Australian soldiers were killed in Afghanistan this week. And they're over there fighting, they think, and the Australian public think, Al-Qaeda, mm -hmm. yet our government's position on Syria is to support the rebels, which include Al-Qaeda. Al -Qaeda. So what did those five soldiers die for 
overnight. Let me go through the details. The Iraq war only happened in 2003 because every single one of Rupert Murdoch's 172 newspapers worldwide campaigned for it. They made sure it happened. Um, it was proven to be based on lies when it happened. So what happened then? The excuse was changed. There was no, oh, well, weapons of mass destruction wasn't really the issue. We rid, of, we rid Iraq of a monster. That's the important thing. Mm -hmm. um, people, journalists hang on editorial independence. The public are fed, oh, it's editorial independence. Garbage. Journalists are whores. They tell us they are selling impartial news but except for a few brave souls, they dance to the tune of their superiors and their agenda. And that's what happened in 2003. We are witnessing in Syria now the most concerted, coordinated, mainstream media disinformation campaign since Iraq. And every citizen should be outraged at this manipulation of the public. Um, before I give the details, first, just to note, the CEC stance on Syria is not to defend Assad. We are opposing the British American policy of using the so called the question of massacres as an excuse to further their agenda of re re regime change and overrun any notion that nations have the right to sovereignty. They're trying to establish a principle here um, that the UN has adopted, Tony Blair's principle of the responsibility to protect. So, no national sovereignty doesn't exist anymore. Um, we condemn any massacre, but for at least the third time now, news of a massacre in Syria has gone around the world to be blamed on Assad, only to be proved that the truth is the opposite of what is being reported. So last week, it was reported that the, re that the government was finally, the Syrian government was finally pushing the rebels back. What happens? Well, as if on cue, on Monday, there was a massacre of I think at least 400 civilians in Daraya outside Damascus, completely blamed on Assad. We put out a press release smelling a rat of a Syrian nun talking about how to date all Western media reporting has been a fake. And she's a nun, she's not an mm. Arab, she's not a, uh, a Muslim or anything, right? So they're in the, the minority there. But that was her view. We, we caught flack for doing that. Now we have a report from no less a person than Robert Fisk, who's from London's independent newspaper, and he's probably the most famous war correspondent in the world. He was the first Westerner on the scene in Daraya, and his reports from first-hand accounts from survivors show that the rebels conducted the massacre yet again. Craig, under this responsibility to protect doctrine, aren't these massacres that they're trying to that happen and they're trying to pin them on Assad, aren't they the, the new WMDs, i.e. they have to be the, they need them as the excuse that um, if, if the British and Obama are going to go in there and invade? This is regime change. We've seen it in Iraq, which is based on lies. We see it on the horrible uh, murder of Li uh, Libya's Gaddafi. We don't agree with Gaddafi and so forth. But this is regime change. It's destruction of national sovereignty. The Assad government is trying to stand up for national sovereignty. And this is also aimed at Which Russia, any government would. Which any government would. This is, I don't know about Australia. Um, this is aimed at, the, at Russia and China, as we've said. Now, we've got plenty of stuff on our website about this, Robbie, and people need to educate themselves. If they believe the media, they're insane. We'll put out a release on this today, and people can look at the details of that, because there's a limit to what we can say here. So just look that up on our website. But we'll have to leave it there for this week's CEC report. As we've said, there's lots of material on our website to, that you can follow up on. We have to, because we cannot allow these injustices to continue. Thanks for tuning in. Tune in next week for more. Mm -hmm.